All right, so we are in James chapter two, and I, I uh, wanted to come. Uh, I wanted to come here to uh, take a look at something. We finished our series on repentance, and so uh, I was thinking through what are the next things for us to uh, look at and to think about together um, as a church here. And I think that it's always good to go back to fundamentals. And James 2 is one of those places you go to uh, where there is important information for every congregation to take into account. And it starts um, in chapter 2, uh, verse 2, with this idea of the uh, person coming into the assembly. And that, you know, that places it or places us within the church, uh, with the, the meeting of the people of God. This is the synagogue, literally, in Greek here. Um, but obviously the meaning of that is when the church comes together, whenever they are able to meet. And so we're thinking in the first paragraph about partiality, the distinction being shown uh, between a rich man and a poor man. And I, I wanted to move on beyond that one. To look at verse eight, because that's where he begins to make a distinction um, that should be made as opposed to the one that was wrong before between rich and poor. Here, the distinction is one between uh, action and words. And that's the thing that's always at issue for us um, as Christians in our lives. James 2, 8, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, then you are doing well. Right, you are doing well if you actually are fulfilling this royal law. And it's royal because our Lord, our King, Jesus, is the one who reiterated, love your neighbor as yourself. It's also because the King, who is the Lord God, gave this commandment. If you really are doing this, you're doing well. And that if you really fulfill is what invites us to think about, uh, well, how do you know? Or where, you know, how do you test this? Um, so the ninth verse said, but if you show partiality, you're committing sin and are convicted by the law's transgressors. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you don't commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. Speak and act like those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. And this, I think, is the important point. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. That, to me, is the important point here. What he's saying is, you know, when, when, when it comes to, well, you know, there is a royal law, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, yeah, and, and we all agree that that's a good thing to do. In fact, it, it's pretty hard to find anybody on the planet who disagrees with that. <laughs> there are crazy people, you know, in California who call themselves Satanists. You say, no, we're diametrically opposed to this, but... Almost nobody, <laughs> almost nobody will do that. Uh, everybody has, likes this idea of treat others the way you wish to be treated. Love your neighbor as yourself. But his thing is keeping the whole law, but failing in one point is nonetheless guilt. And we don't mean by this some kind, we're looking for some uh, neurotic definition of sinless perfection. What we mean by this is that Everything is important. Everything matters. How we live and the, the choices that we make, the things that we do or the things that we don't do matter with the Lord. And that there's a whole picture here, not to focus in on, um, you know, some narrow definition of what constitutes faith uh, or what constitutes rightness, justice, but to be uh, open and aware to the entirety of the law of God about what we ought to do be and do that's what he's getting at uh, you know they said don't commit adultery they also said don't murder you you may not commit adultery but if you murder well you're a transgressor of the law 
any one thing that is not what God wants is guilt. And it doesn't necessarily, you know, in that, in that way of thinking, it doesn't matter how many of the other commands you may be keeping or how many of the other activities you may be engaged in. That doesn't matter if you are lacking in something that God wants of us. That's his point. So speak and act like those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. The law of liberty is the law of Christ. The way that we speak, the way that we act is that we will be judged under the law of liberty. We know that we're going to be judged for the things that we say, the things that we do. Knowing this is so ahead of time should produce a specific kind of life. Judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment, though. Well, why talk about mercy here? Because we're talking about brotherly love. If you, you, you know, there's a royal law to love your neighbor as yourself. Meaning, how are we treating each other? That's the idea. Are we brothers and sisters in the Lord? How are we treating each other? What are we, what are we doing that is different over and above what the world might do? Judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Meaning that if we ourselves are not fulfilling our responsibility to love others as, as uh, ourselves, uh, we're not going to be receiving the mercy of God for that. If you would triumph in the judgment, you would do so by showing mercy in this life, showing love. For the brethren, treating others as you would be treated. Which is why he goes immediately into that 14th verse. What good is it, brothers, if someone says he has faith but doesn't have works? Can that faith save him? Uh, works here, actions. Someone says he has belief or trust in God, but he doesn't have the actions what we mean by this is it's all talk. <laughs> we say that we love God or that we are, you know, part of the faith, if you will, but then the actions do not accord. Um, what good is it, he said? Can that save? It? Can, can trusting in God in such a way that you do not have any actions in evidence save you? And, you know, spoiler alert, no, it can't. That is dead. But the picture here is of good intentions, right? Of maybe saying the right things, taking the right positions, so, so to speak. But the actions are not there. And they need to be. If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled. Without giving them the things needed for the body, well, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it has no action, is dead. Right, if there is somebody who is a part of the congregation who is poor, they do not have what they need to be properly clothed, sheltered. You know, they don't have what they need uh, to feed themselves, to feed their families. We cannot just say, go in peace, be warmed and filled. I mean, there, can, there has to be more than well-wishing. <laughs> there has to be action that follows with that. It's, uh, it's good to say, go in peace. Um, you know, like this is not... If you will, this is not your fault, or this is not uh, a reflection of your character, right? These kinds of things are the meaning of go in peace. Be warmed and filled. This, this is well-wishing. But to say this and then not to give them what they need for the body, that uh, doesn't do any good. What good is that? Well, it's no good. That's not going to work. Uh, what, what do you think will work? If the children of God are not activated, if the, if the children of God are not working, then what do you think will work? I mean, 
uh, is it going to be squirrels and chipmunks are, are going to come in like in Snow White through the windows and drop food on the table for them? I mean, no, that's not going to happen. If you don't do it, it won't be done. That's what this is saying. Go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed. What good is that? None. That's not doing any good. I dare say it's doing harm because there's like this, there's one message that comes out that sounds like it's right, but then the, what actually happens is not in sync. It's not there. Faith also by itself without actions is dead. To answer the question of what good is that? Yeah, it's dead. It's no good. 18th continues, someone will say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works. I will show you my faith by my works. Yes, you have faith, I have works. So someone might say, I will take care of it for you. You have the faith and I will go take care of it. Right? That's an out for you not to do it. <laughs> and James is saying, no, show me your faith apart from your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. It cannot be righteousness by proxy. You take the actions or you don't. Right? You care about the people and about the brethren or you don't. This is important to you, or it is not important. It's a priority, or it is not a priority. That where's the time going? Where is the effort going? Where where are the prayers going? The thoughts, the activities, the um, you know, the money, the whatever, all the things that can be counted, some of which count. <laughs> uh, where is that going? And is it going to the service of God and to His people? You believe God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You do well. It's kind of like good for you. You believe God is one. Yes, so do the demons. It's going to take more than believing there is one God. Um, and it's going to take more than, you know, believing in the wonderful plan of Ephesians 4 as well, right? The one faith. Um, you know, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one spirit. Right? People talk about this, and of course it's true. And there is one body of the faith. There's one group uh, of the Lord's people, the churches. And that's all true. But, yeah, the churches are made of people, Christians. And the Christians are there to help one another, to work with one another to work for one another. This is what he's getting at. The demons believe in one God. I mean, monotheism is not uh, unique and is not sufficient. Do you want to be shown, foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Wasn't Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and uh, faith was completed by his works. And that is when the scripture was fulfilled. The scripture that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You see a person is justified by works, not by faith alone. Well, Abraham had been given the promise that through Isaac would his seed be named. Isaac was the son of promise, not Ishmael. And yet, when the Lord tested him, he was to offer up Isaac in sacrifice, which he effectively did. Uh, the Lord stopped his hand from actually killing the boy, but he he was going to do it. He was doing what the Lord had told him to do because he expected that God would raise him from the dead. He very clearly told the servants 
the boy and I will go over there and worship and the boy and I will come back to you again. It's clear that he expected God to raise him from the dead. So, you know, don't shudder in horror at what was being, at what was unfolding before you. It's, it's fairly simple, actually. He trusted God so much that, you know, in some sense, he wasn't too worried about that. He knew that God had made the promise and that he would keep it. And the logical conclusion is that he could raise this child from the dead. That's very reasonable. And in fact, it is what he did in the case of his own son. But as he says, Abraham was justified by works when he offered up his son. And he had a promise. He had words to him, which he believed. But God tested him. And this is an interesting thing because it means that there are things God chooses, you know, not to know ahead of time or not to see that he gives you free will. You can make a choice and he allows that to happen. And when that does happen and the choice is to obey God, there's the works, right? To do, to take the actions that God asks for, that proves your faith. That faith Verse 22 is active along with works. That faith was completed by means of the works because that's when the scripture was fulfilled that said Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. See, a lot of times people want this to be, well, you know, it's a mental exercise. As soon as he believed God, what he said, well, he was right. No, no. it's saying that he believed God as evidenced by the fact that he was willing to obey him to offer his son. That is when it was counted righteousness. That's when he was justified. We're not being helped by the translation. This 23rd verse, righteousness, that's justification, justified. You see a person is justified by works, verse 24, not by faith alone. This person, Abraham, was justified by works. That's what we're saying. Also at verse 21. But he was not called just or counted just. And he was not called the friend of God prior to the obedience. Though we are told that he believed God and that's good. He also, in fulfillment of what is written, followed through with the actions. All right. In the same way, also Rahab, justified by works when receiving the messengers and sending them out another way. It's one thing to hear the word. And for that matter, as James said, the demons believe and and tremble. Well, if you look back at the account of Rahab speaking to the spies, she told them, when we heard what the Lord had done for you on the way out to Egypt and that you were coming here, our hearts melted away. Uh, They were terrified. But only one family was saved, and it was the family of Rahab, because only one family acted accordingly. It's, you know, they were, everybody purportedly was afraid, but only one family actually obeyed, actually did something about it, and that was Rahab. And so in this way, she is justified by works. They believed, they all believed, according to her account, but only one obeyed, and that's the one who was saved. It's fairly clear. But again, um, this is not an esoteric, uh, you know, theological point here that he's making. His point, if you recall, is... What good is it if someone says he has faith but does not have works? It's got to be, there has to be action. There has to be activity and follow through. He gives the example of a needy person. Okay, that's a good example and fairly clear that if there's a brother or a sister in need in the congregation, that should not, um, that should not be so. We should make sure that their needs are met because we're Christians. 
but it's just an example. Um, you know, the, the fact is that in any congregation, many things need to be done. Uh, and in some sense, there's, you know, I guess, a prioritization of things that need to be done. I would say that the priority ought to be the, the needs of the saints. Um, you know, to be uh, straightforward about these things, I mean, the congregation does have and, and always has needs. Um, any congregation does. You know, we have uh, a sister who is in a, a, in a nursing facility. Um, for a time, we couldn't, we couldn't find her. We didn't know where they had taken her to, and she didn't have the presence of mind to be able to do anything about that. And, but she's been found now, but uh, she is going to need a lot of help to be able to watch the services. Um, we're, you know, now that we're using Zoom for our members, she could do that, and that would be encouraging, but she needs help doing that too. Uh, you know, uh, iPads and the internet were invented well after she was gray-headed. <laughs> she needs help with this. Uh, so we ought to have, you know, some way of getting some kind of help to do that. And I would think that's an important and useful spiritual need that somebody has that can be met. Uh, we have some who have ill health, um, whose health is such that they can't get out of the house or they can't take care of things. Uh, I don't, I can't think of a reason why members of the congregation couldn't and shouldn't be helping them with things like mowing the lawn or cutting branches, hauling things off or whatever needs to be done. Uh, groceries, perhaps. I don't know. We'd have to ask what the needs are. <laughs> but that has to be done. We, 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 need, we should ask what the needs are, and then we should meet them. And if you think about it, well, why wouldn't that be done? Well, there's lots of reasons, perhaps. Um, I know, and I'm trying to be balanced about it, uh, I know uh, I had heard from one of the, you know, the social gospel churches that if you're too busy to entertain brethren, then you're too busy, you know, and they just got it wrong. This isn't about, it's not about social gatherings and entertainment and having people over to your house. That's not what we're talking about. Although people usually conflate that with spiritual work or fellowship, but there's nothing biblical about that idea. However, there is a kernel of truth in that, which is the reason that Satan uses it, which is if you're too busy for the work of the Lord, you're too busy. And if there's not time to attend to your brethren's needs, you need to change something and make it so that there is time for your brethren's needs. Because I can't think of anything you need to do more importantly. What should be, what should have the priority over the work of the church? I can think of nothing. I understand, you know, I have a job too. Uh, you got a job, you got kids, you know, I know, I get it. Everybody's very busy, but we've got to make the time. We've got to make the ability, we've got to make the effort. And that's where it, you know, that's where the 14th verse is. What good is it to say, but not do? That's no good. That can't save you. And so it's, you know, it's my job, I guess, as the evangelist or as a teacher of the Bible to be straightforward about this is what it says. You need to be doing. If you're not doing, you're not being saved either. And that's not because I said so and it's not up to me. That's what the Bible teaches. The church can only grow when the members are doing what they're supposed to do when each part is supplying the needs of the others. You know, somebody needs whatever it might be. People need rides, perhaps to the doctor, trips to the pharmacy, things of this nature. It could be a lot of things, but whatever it is, we've got to have the time to do that for the brethren in the local congregation. 
And if there isn't, um, you know, if that's not evident in our lives, well, what is evident in our lives? I mean, where is the time going? Where is the money going? Where Where is the effort going? Uh, and then we're invited to compare Malachi chapter one and two, right? With this thing about offer it then to your governor. He said, would this work in any other circumstance or any, any other context? The level of service that you're providing, the level of attendance that you are providing to the Lord and the work of the Lord. Would you continue to be employed like that? If you did that at work, would you, you know, would you get anywhere in politics if you did that in Congress, you know, or whatever it might be? Those are reasonable comparisons. Those are reasonable things to think about. That's fine. It's biblical. But yeah, it comes back to, well, at some point, you know, there has to be action and everything else has to be excuses, really. Uh, that's kind of all there is. There's, there's doing the things that God expects and accomplishing what God wants and everything else is just excuses. I mean, they seem, they seem good. They seem convincing, but no, that cannot be. God made all of us. He made our abilities. He blessed us with our abilities and with our opportunities, with our income, with our, you know, everything that we have. So I can see no reason why that wouldn't be sufficient with which to accomplish what he has tasked us with. I can't see how that would be. Um, everything else is excuses, really. And that's what we have to reckon with in James 2. The hard thing about it being so simple is, you know, you read it and you say, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I agree with that. Well, of course I agree with that. Like I said, I mean, who doesn't agree with this? <laughs> and you find anybody who will say, oh, no, it's fine. You just use the words and that's good enough. You know, nobody does that. That's the hard thing about it. It's tricky. We think, oh, well, yes, I agree with that. Yes, I would teach that. Right. But do you do that? Is the activity in evidence? There's so many things in any place that need to be done, that people need one another. Where is the love of the brother, the love of the sister, the love of the neighbor? If, you know, we don't even know what the needs are, uh, let alone actually do something to meet them. Um, I can't pass. I cannot pass muster in the day of judgment with the Lord. That's my reading of this. And maybe you have a different reading. We can talk about it later. But when I'm looking at this, I don't see a way out of it. It's got to be that we're either giving the things necessary or it's just talk. And that is just death. Because faith by itself without action is dead. It's very tricky. It seems good. Uh, but no, it's not going to work. There are so many things that are like this um, in life. You can see it in so many things. Uh, management and leadership of right, politics, government, but also of corporations, companies. Uh, you know, you'll hear things about, well, you know, we don't have the budget for this. Or, uh, you know, the, we don't have the funds to do that. No, that's not true. Yes, they do. They just choose to use them on something else. <laughs> and they'll say, well, but, you know, that's by, that's required. We have to do it right. Required by what? Well, it's required by this, whatever, agreement, or by this law, or by this code. Right. The same one that you break to do the other thing that you really want to do? <laughs> I don't believe you. You do what you want. They'll find the funding. When they want to do it, they'll find the funding. Don't ever believe that story about, well, we just don't have the budget. Uh, the funds have already been allocated. No, that's not true. They just don't want to do it. Don't believe that story. That's not true. It's never been true. They fund whatever they want to do. 
they have the funds. They have the power. The people who do the accounting report to them. Understand? They're doing what they want. It sounds good, though. Well, I would, but I, you know, my hands are tied. Well, but that's not true. God makes sure that you have the opportunity to do what is right. God understand. That's the point here is we're all of us on the hook. And some good old fashioned accounting, I think is a reasonable thing. Like, you know, how much time is being spent? How much effort is being spent? Where is my time going? Where is the effort going? Where is the money going? Because Rahab, for her part, you know, immediately took action. She heard the story. She knew what it meant. She left the old life and immediately took the spies in. And immediately she's hiding them. She's sending them off to safety, um, you know, giving them the information they need to be able to get out of there and preserving her family alive, telling everybody who will be saved about this who gather into her home, and they're the people who were saved from Jericho. Not everybody in Jericho died. Because she did it. Because she took the initiative. If she had waited for whoever's job it is to do that, well, it would never have been the job of of a prostitute woman. That would never have been her job. She waited for that. And it's never your job, if you will. Oh, that's, yeah, somebody ought to do that. Yeah, well, somebody should. If only somebody attended here. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> you attend here. I attend here. Somebody, they don't. No. It's like the old family circle cartoon, not me. Remember the little the little ghost, not me? He was responsible for everything that went wrong in the home with children. <laughs> wow, this face is broken on the floor. Who did this? Not me, not me. Not me. Right? That's that's it. Now me is responsible for everything. Problem is, he's not a member of this family. Somebody is not a member of this congregation either. You are the member of this congregation, and so am I. We are the ones whose job it is. That means you are the one who fits the job description. Rahab's position as a woman in an ancient society and as a prostitute uh, did not in any way qualify her to be the ambassador to the people of God (laughs) or to be in the lineage of the Christ, but she is. Now, what qualified her was her faith, but specifically her justification by action that followed up with that faith. And it overcame the way that she used to live. See, when he says Rahab the prostitute, It just left his mouth that mercy triumphs over judgment. She showed mercy to the spies. She showed mercy to her family. And she triumphed over the judgment that took the lives of the rest of Jericho. By means of faith, yes, but by means of action that accords with faith. So, again, it's on us, isn't it? We're going to be judged by that law of liberty. We're going to be judged. And we are at liberty, basically. This is a free country, or it used to be until very recently. And we have the option to exercise. You know, we can move. We can spend. We can take time. We can make effort. We are at liberty, too. And that liberty should be used in the service of God because he who was called while free is the Lord's servant, the Lord's bondservant. We ought to bring our things into it. Revelation says the kings of the earth bring their glory into it. And that's where we stand, the kings of the earth uh, living in this place at this time. We ought to be bringing all of these things into the service of God and making it so. Yes, we have people that have a lot of needs to be served, to be attended to, and that has got to be a thing that is rather important. Uh, We 
you know, have brethren that have been unable to assemble. And that should be a concern that we, we ought to get together and figure out how to help them. Um, many things that need to be done by brothers and sisters. So James is a tough thing. It's the truth. I don't see any difference here. Um, I don't see a way out of this, really. It really is what he's saying. If you really fulfill that law, you're doing well. But whoever fails at one point is guilty of all. It's not enough to say and not do. You gotta do. It has to be there. Well, today, were you a Christian, a child of God, will become a child of God, that you might be saved, that you might be active in the Lord and accomplish the things that he wants from you. If today you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus, put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins, will help you find water to do this. Are you a Christian who has not lived right? Repent, make things right with him. Help, let us help you with prayer. Uh, let us help you with encouragement. This ought to be a place, you know, as we said before, it's, it's, this ought to be a safe place for the child of God. This should be the place where it's safe to say what your needs are. or are safe to volunteer for things, safe to say you believe in God and that you want to show the kindness of the Lord. Um, the faith, the trust that God is going to take care of you and God is going to help you when you are eager to do his will and to do charity for those who are around you. Um, that has to be a real thing and an active thing. And you'll see that when that happens, God will bless us. Arguably, if we will not do so, I wouldn't think that God would bless it either. Why would he send some poor soul to be among a congregation that will not help them, that will not meet needs, that will not take time? Arguably, that kind of makes sense. So we will make sure that that is not the case. We will take the actions that are necessary and have the children of God um, as our preference. We are to prefer one another. That is not about a cultish or slavish, um, you know, social inbreeding. That is about the children of God have needs too, and those should be met because they are the children of God. And we are God's hands in this world to meet those needs. That should be, you know, the very first thing, the minimum thing. And then we can help others too. And there's plenty to do. But it needs to start with the household of God, which we are. We are related to one another, and we are blessed in that. If you're not a Christian, we'll help you to obey the gospel. If you need the prayers of the saints, please let your need be known now by coming to the front. I will stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>